Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live Prostate Cancer. I'm Patty Satalia. Prostate cancer is one of the two most common cancers among men. One in seven men will be diagnosed within their lifetime. Prostate cancer can be slow growing or aggressive and treatment options vary widely based on the particulars of each case. How do you know what's right for you? Tonight our experts will discuss detection, treatment and prognosis. They'll also take your questions. <coughs> now let's meet our guests. Dr. Richard Ditlow Jr. is an oncologist with the Prostate Cancer Center in Camp Hill, a practice devoted exclusively to the care and treatment of this disease. Dr. Christopher Yingling is a urologist with Mount Nittany Physician Group in State College and is trained in robotically assisted surgery. Greg Peterson is director of broadcasting at WPSU. Peterson was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2002 and says if he had known then what he knows now, he would have chosen a different treatment strategy. Uh, you can join our conversation tonight. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242 and our email address is connect at psu.edu. You may also tweet your question or comment to WPSU Connect and use hashtag WPSU Conversations. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I begin with you, Dr. Uh, Ditlow. Doctors frequently say most men die with prostate cancer, not of it. So give us the current statistics. How many men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer and what percentage will be the slow growing versus the aggressive form of the disease? Uh, exact numbers I don't have, but roughly, as you said, one out of seven uh, men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer throughout. And the vast majority, uh, you know, in the patients we see, I'd say probably 60 or 70 percent are what would be either, either low or intermediate risk disease. So that means the others are high risk disease. It's, it's not a, it generally is a rather slow growing type of cancer, but still roughly about 25 to 27,000 men die every year from prostate cancer. And it also can be a very um, painful and uh, very, very painful and uncomfortable uh, death, to be quite frank, because the, the uh, metastasis to the bone is, can be very painful. The diagnosis of prostate cancer, interestingly enough, it can be devastating for a number of reasons, but mostly because it often comes out of the blue. Men are feeling just fine. They have no inkling that there might be something wrong. So I'm curious to know what led to your prognosis, Greg Peterson? Um, uh, the year before I actually got diagnosed, I had had uh, a, a sudden attack in the, my lower abdomen region, and I couldn't explain it. It lasted about two days, fevers, chills, went away. And so I didn't know what it was. I was at a conference at the time out of town. When I came back, I saw my general practitioner, and he said, well, you know, this, this could be prostatitis. Now, I'll tell you what, we'll do a PSA. And do a PSA, and they came back just about a point higher than it should be for my age. So it was inconclusive. It was inconclusive. So he said, why don't you go see a urologist? And then I went and saw that. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting because most men are asymptomatic, and there is a new federal advisory, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force in 2012, mm -hmm. advised to the shock of many patients right. and doctors that there not be routine PSA tests. Correct. They kind of surprised the urology community a bit, I think in the oncology community as well, when they came out with these recommendations against a PSA test. The history of PSA is actually relatively short. It was actually, I believe, identified by a Penn State graduate student who had moved to Buffalo and then developed it, but it didn't really come into vogue until the early 1990s. So this was a new test that we knew saved lives. It really d drastically decreased the mortality, the death of, from prostate cancer numbers. The problem with the test is that it goes up for a lot of reasons that have nothing to do with prostate cancer. The PSA cancer. test, the, the number may be high and, <clears throat> and you don't have cancer. Correct. So it goes up for lots of the reasons that have nothing to do with cancer and they lead to a lot of extra procedures, biopsies and exams and stress and things like that that patients don't necessarily benefit from. Um, and it, in fact may be harmed from. Correct. Correct. In, so, in terms of lifelong uh, side effects. Correct. Now the interesting part of it is that we still diagnose the vast majority of our prostate cancers based on either PSA or just routine annual physical screening, the dreaded finger exam. And those are still the two best things we have right now to find early prostate cancer because there really are no symptoms of early prostate cancer for the majority of men. You know, it, it's interesting because a lot of men don't like the idea that their doctor is now saying you don't get a PSA <laughs> test. Yeah. They're saying, you know, to stop looking doesn't make sense. Maybe change what you do once you get a PSA that's mm -hmm. a little bit high. But, but to not look, look for it uh, seems wrong-headed to lots of people. And in fact, some say it, it will lead to more deaths. And I'm wondering, three years out, has it? 
Well, I think we've seen more advanced cancer being found de novo, meaning people coming in with more advanced cancer rather than finding earlier cancer. So we're seeing a little bit of a stage migration where we're seeing the worst cancers up front. Um, as a urologist, we tend to still feel that there's a lot of value in a PSA test. It's important to kind of understand the full picture of the patient. If they have prostatitis or other acute issues that may cause the PSA to rise, then you have to factor that into their evaluation and understand is this a true PSA value or is it up for other reasons. But we still think there's an awful lot of value in that test and it's a little bit frustrating in a lot of ways to see the recommendations of the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force. I want to get back to that a mm -hmm. in a minute, but we do have our first phone call. Uh, Rhonda from State College, you're on the air. Hi. Um, my husband's family has a history of breast cancer, and I was wondering if that puts him at risk for prostate cancer. Interesting question. Dr. Ditlow? Well, there, there is some connection uh, between uh, the BRCA genes for breast Bracca. cancer and prostate cancer. Uh, it's still, though, it, it's... Um, it's rare. Even actually, even the the BRCA genes for breast cancer are, aren't as common as you might think from all the media. But there can be a connection. You have you have to be concerned if uh, I mean it is something to be considered if there's a lot of uh, family history of breast cancer and someone you know with pros for their prostate cancer too. There is a possible connection. Well, she brings up something interesting, and that's risk factors. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that African Americans uh, have a higher incidence of uh, prostate cancer. Uh, age plays a factor. What are other, uh, Dr. Dr. Yingling, other factors that uh, put someone at risk? Family history is the number one thing. If you have a first degree relative or two first degree relatives, your personal risk for prostate cancer drastically increases. Uh, so, family history as well as race and age are the big things. So, if you have a family history, ask for this PSA test. Is there something better than the PSA test? Currently, no. Uh, I think there are two components that are very important for screening. PSA is just an initial screening test. It doesn't diagnose or rule out prostate cancer. It just helps alert us to who we need to look close, more closely at to try to figure out who could have it. So you still need a finger exam, a physical exam. Um, there are other tests that we use to help differentiate a slight rise in PSA uh, and try to decide is it up because of cancer or up because of other reasons. So there's nothing right now that can replace a PSA, but there are other tests that we use as additives to it to try to help better understand it. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Uh, I like to make the point too, the, the digital exam, the finger exam is most, I think is most important when you have your very first PSA mm -hmm. because the PSA normally is four or less. And so if your PSA comes back at 2.67, that can be elevated because there are some patients their normal PSA mm -hmm. is 0.7. So if you don't know what your PSA was before and you get a, a PSA and it's 2.7 but the urologist or your feels an abnormality, well then you have to biopsy that because you, you don't know what your normal PSA you know, was before. So that's when the, I think the digital exam is especially important when you have your very first PSA. It's important afterwards too but that's when it's really important. Go, go ahead. I agree with that and I think it's also important to know that PSA values tend to rise throughout our lives so that in a younger man, a man around the age of 50, a PSA of 2.6 or 2.7 may really be a very elevated PSA. Uh, a man who's in their 60s or 70s, maybe a PSA of 6 or so may not be that high. So you have to look at it in the big picture of things with the patient and their overall situation as well. But I agree about the yeah. finger exam. And, and, right. all, and also the PSA is not just the numbers. If it's how mm -hmm. fast it's, it's rising, so you, you would watch it over time. Yep. Right. So Trend. Greg Peterson, at the beginning of the program, we said that you would have done something differently had you been diagnosed today. Explain why you say that. Well, my PSA was 3.5, uh, which was about... You were maybe 49. A, and I was 49, maybe a half a point or more mm -hmm. over what it should be. And, um, and they did try a, uh, a long a course of antibiotics to see if it was prostatitis. I got retested for the PSA. PSA didn't drop down. Mm -hmm. So um, after my first biopsy, it was inconclusive. There's some, they said the cells look like there's some changes, but there's nothing conclusive. So I went through a series of, of biopsies. I had three biopsies, each about four or five months apart, until on the third biopsy, they actually found something. So it told me, it tells me now, it was pretty hard to find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't widespread. Uh, it was so encapsulated. It was pretty it well had, encapsulated. It had not metastasized. And, and, but you hear the word cancer, and you just say, I want to be done with this. But now I think I would have done the wait, watchful waiting thing and watch it closely for a while until <clears throat> something had to be done. Because that would have eliminated some of the uh, side effects that I had for, with urological complications. I, I want to get back to side effects, but two-thirds <clears throat> get a, a, a PSA 
that is sort of inconclusive, but 90% say, I want a treatment for the exact reason that Greg Peterson said. The big C is still a very, very scary thing. Dr. Ditlow. But yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, and, and I, I, that's put out as a reason for not doing PSAs because it said, well, if patients know they have cancer, they're going to want treatment. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that, <laughs> you know, I mean, but, you know, we've tried, we've sort of, I would say, bowed at the altar of, of uh, informing the patient, informed consent, um, making the, letting the patient make the decisions, all of which I totally agree with. But when it comes to something like this, well, no, we, you, you are going to want something we don't want you to have. And that just doesn't make any sense to there me There are either. lots of people who think this comes down to money. It costs money to, to provide this test. And, but there's no harm in the test, whereas with mammography, where the recommendations have also been changed, with mammography, there is mm -hmm. the exposure to radiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. So yeah. let, let me take a, a phone call. We've got uh, Vernon, who's calling us from Williamsport. Vernon, you're on the air. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Why, uh... I'm 81 years of age. I'm having some prostate problems. And my urologist is very reluctant to do anything because of my age. He said he doesn't want me dying on the mm -hmm. operating table. And he's reluctant to do even, uh, I call it rotor rooter mm -hmm. process. And he did say he would agree to what they termed a microwave procedure where they go in and microwave that and it shrinks up the, the urinary tract. Direct radiation, maybe what he's talking about? No, or? it's actually oh. a treatment to actually, it's a, for a benign prostatic enlargement to improve voiding okay. and your ability to urinate. Well, the only thing I had, uh, uh, he's reluctant to do anything because of a urinary tract infection, what they call a host infection, mm -hmm. that it clears up and then it comes back and I've been trying for months now to get rid of the doggone thing so mm -hmm. that uh, they can do uh, one of these procedures well, because I've been wearing a bag for a mm -hmm. year, you know. Right. What, what advice would you have for this caller? Well, Vernon, I think you have a really frustrating situation that we unfortunately see in a lot of men. Um, infections for men in the bladder and the prostate, those often have to do with an inability to empty your bladder completely. So in general, recurrent infections are a reason to do a procedure, a microwave or the rotor rooter which we call a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. Those are not prostate cancer treatments, those are treatments to help you urinate better, empty your bladder more efficiently and then in turn hopefully avoid the need for a catheter or avoid recurrent infections. I would tell you that there's always the Hippocratic Oath that we take which the first rule is do no harm. So we have to look at you as a person and decide are your risks of getting under surgery and going through surgery worthwhile to go through the treatment. I would tell you that at 81, the age itself is not the scariest thing. Our population is, goes much beyond that, and we often have people in their 80s that make it through surgery without any trouble. But we have to look at the whole picture for you, and without knowing those things, I can't tell you for sure. But I'd keep, keep looking. A microwave is an okay procedure. Um, and TERP is a better procedure generally for people who have a recurrent, or recurrent infections as well as urinary retention. But I can't tell you that specifically without knowing the other details. Dr. Ditlow, anything to add? No, that's... No, it's you not. would have said the same thing. Okay. I would not have said anything. That's, <laughs> oh. that's purely urology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your call, Vernon, and, and best of, of luck to you. We go to Brian, who's calling us from Export. Go ahead, please, Brian. Yes, my father just passed away from prostate cancer on October 11th, and he had elected to do a procedure called cryology where they froze the prostate, and it's still metastasized to his bones and to his liver uh, towards the end. And my question might be, I, I felt, for one, that it might have kept him alive, having gone through that, but would there have been something better besides cryology, for instance, radiation, or removal of the prostate that might have been more effective or might have made him or allowed him to live longer? That, that, it's an my... Thank you. It's an interesting question because from what I'm reading, there isn't one treatment that is superior to the others. Are, do you agree with that? I do agree with it, and I think the most important thing you have to take home from prostate cancer is that prostate cancer is not the same uniformly. Different types of cancer, people who have an early stage Gleason 6 prostate cancer tend to uniformly do well with no matter, with any treatment you choose. People with an aggressive high risk prostate cancer unfortunately tend not to do particularly well with any of the treatments for cure, which treatments for cure mean radiation, surgery, or theoretically cryotherapy. Um, so which is freezing, we should tell yes, people. Yes, freezing. Yeah. 
Um, so without knowing the details of your father's prostate cancer, I can't tell you again if there would have been a better option for him. Um, but what we might want to tell him is that he is at two to three times the Correct. risk that someone whose family member doesn't have uh, prostate cancer. What's your advice to him, Dr. Well, Ditlow? Well, it's not really advice, but the cryosurgery is, I think, generally used in, <clears throat> in patients who are older and maybe can't uh, tolerate surgery and even external beam radiation therapy, and also for patients where there is a specific nodule that they can uh, you know, freeze. The difficulty with cryosurgery, it's difficult for them to freeze the whole, from my understanding, I haven't done that and maybe you guys mm. have, but, but my understanding is it's difficult for them to freeze the entire gland because they have to be very careful because they can damage the surrounding structures if they overfreeze things. Mm -hmm. So the, that's, my understanding, that's the problems, you know, the, the problem with cryosurgery is that they may not be able to freeze the whole gland and so therefore it may not be a curative procedure in a particular person. My understanding, just to repeat it, my understanding is that the ideal patient is someone who has a single, as a main nodule that can, that itself can just be frozen in someone who's older and has no other treatment. Is, uh, is hormone treatment still viable to shrink the size of the prostate? It is. It is. Tes testosterone tends to be the fuel for prostate growth and prostate cancer growth. And if you use hormones to block the, t the act of testosterone in your system, we do see a physical change in the prostate where it will shrink in size, which can make it more amenable to different procedures, not necessarily surgery, but cryotherapy or radiation. It may increase sensitivity to radiation as well. So the mm -hmm. hormone therapy is, is short term it, or no? It varies. Varies. Okay, because I, I, I've read about a lot of men who yeah. think there's uh, death might be better because uh, the way they feel, they are mm -hmm. lethargic, they have hot flashes that women you know, right. this is this is old hat for, for women, but uh, new to men. Right. I think that actually that's one of the most important things that was not addressed by the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force that they that when they looked at all of this. They looked at death as an endpoint of all their studies, saying <laughs> PSAs, where people who were short-term weren't necessarily doing better. Long-term, we know they do. But one thing they didn't look at was side effects of the treatments we have. The treatment that I think has the most side effects and the most problems is actually hormone treatment. Wow. Uh, it's the one that men complain about the most. Okay, I, I'm gonna talk to you and your experience, Greg Peterson. You chose brachytherapy, uh, which is, uh, uh, well, tell us what it is. It's radioactive small radioactive seeds uh, that, are, that are implanted uh, throughout the prostate. I had 128 seeds put in, and they're about the size of, oh, about 30 seconds of an inch wide and maybe about uh, eighth of an inch long. They look like pencil leads mm -hmm. from mechanical pencils. They're really small. And they're there for life. They're there for life. And uh, there, there's some, you know, they, they say you could pass one in your and I never did. And they give you a little bottle to put in a lead butt pouch in case you find one. But, but, but. Because it, of the radioactivity. Because of the radioactivity. And you, all, you also, they told me you need to sleep apart from your wife for a couple of weeks. And I guess no increased radiation to anybody. Uh, but I've, I, I had time to look at a bunch of different modalities. And uh, uh, prostatectomy was was removing the prostate. Removing the prostate, and I know people who have had that and have not done very well with it. And I uh, have a brother-in-law who did not very well with that at all, and still isn't doing very well with it. Uh, radioactive seeds, the cryotherapy, the, the external beam radiation, the external beam the, the radiation, uh, and I chose the, the seeds. But I, I, like I said, knowing now, I probably would have waited because it wasn't the fact that it took them three biopsies to actually find the cancer at all. <clears throat> told me that it was a pretty a pretty small it was a pretty non-aggressive cancer you say that in part because 20 to 40 percent of prostate cancer patients end up with uh, side effects uh, complications as right. a result what happened with you uh, after about a, a year uh, I had your 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 urological problems where I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had to catheterize myself, myself for about a year and a half, be self-catheterization. And uh, after about a year and a half, that cleared up, so I could uh, urinate without a problem. Uh, I still, I sometimes would throw up blood clots once in a while because of that, and then uh, just about four years ago, I was gonna have both knees replaced, and which required a catheter to be put in. Well, I was on the table, I was out, and I had ready the Ready for up, surgery. Ready for surgery and they couldn't get a catheter in. And um, uh, Dr. Miller, one of your <laughs> colleagues, was, happened to be in there, and so he got in, got a cystoscope in, and said, boy, he's got a pinhole there. So he finally got a catheter in me, and, but the surgery was off then because of the, the, the possibility of infection. And so I had to uh, do that, go through a terp to make it wide enough and recover from that, and then I could go back and have the knee surgery. Was the pinhole a result of the radiation seeds? Most likely. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say yes. And unfortunately, one of the side effects, and it can happen with surgery as well, is that you can have scarring of the urethra, the tube that drains the bladder that run, runs basically through the prostate. Unfortunately, I think that's what happened. Yeah, and, and it just, he said it was just so much scar tissue yeah. that I just had a pinhole left, and, and Dr. Miller said he was surprised I could even urinate. Mm -hmm. But um, it, so I was, and, and um, it, it, that happened. And then it just happened again a couple of days ago where it just, all out of the blue, I'm not urinating anymore. So had to go in and get it kind of cleaned out. Now, interestingly, you have been, and you call it, your prostate cancer has been undetectable for nine or ten years. Yeah, the PSA. Why do you say undetectable rather than cured? Well, from what I understand, it's never a cure. I mean, there's a possibility it can come back. I've been told the possibility after so many years now, it's been, what, 13 years, uh, 14 years, is not really great because every PSA I've had has been, you know, less than 0 0.01, which is, I guess, basically undetectable. Mm -hmm. and they, so I'm, I'm, I'm knock, knock on, on wood. wood. So, but uh, I guess you still do the PSA because the possibility is it can come back. All right. I want to take a, a, an email and then a couple of phone calls that are stacking up here. Uh, Robert writes, does diet affect your chance of getting prostate cancer? Dr. Ditlow, I'll, I'll let you feel that first. <laughs> I know obesity is a risk factor. It's what, it, all, there's a lot of things like and that. There are some studies that show perhaps there is increased risk, and there are other studies that show there isn't. The real, as we've already talked about, the real risks, the main risk is uh, family history. And these other things may or may not. But I have read an interesting question because I have read that vegetarians have a lower incidence of prostate cancer. Yeah, there are certain things in the diet that we think may decrease your risk a little bit. The problem with it is we don't know how early in life you need to start consuming those things to have the benefit at the age when you would develop prostate cancer. But the one molecule that I know of, or molecule is not the right word, selenium, the one yeah. uh, selenium. Okay. Is, is the one thing that we know is protective. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting to know. Uh, Jim from Johnstown, thank you for your patience. You're on the air. Hello. Um, my question is, uh, and I've been, uh, I've been doctoring with my urologist for over 10 years for uh, an enlarged abnormal prostate, and uh, uh, some recent tests show that I may uh, now have uh, the start of prostate cancer, but something new has come up in the uh, conversations, and it's uh, called the Gleason score, which I'm not too sure what that's all about. Let, let's let's talk about it. Thank mm -hmm. you for your call, Jim. The Gleason score, you know it, yours. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what it is, Dr. Ditlow. Well, the Gleason score is the pathologist's evaluation of how aggressive the cancer cells look. It's not totally an opinion. Uh, the pathologist does look for certain criteria, but it's not yet a test that we take the slide and put it in a computer and it spits out the Gleason score. And you get two numbers. The Gleason actually scale goes from 0 to 5, or 1 to 5, and because prostate cancer tends to be mixed, you get, uh, you get two numbers. And how it's used is that if the Gleason score is less than 7, uh, number 6, and your PSA is less than 10, then it's probably low risk. Uh, if it, the Gleason score is higher than 7 and or your, and your PSA is like over 20, that's uh, high risk, and then in between is the intermediate risk. But the Gleason score, again, it's an evaluation of, by the pathologist of how aggressive the cancer cells look. And, and what about stages, though? Because we also hear about prostate cancer in stage 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. Staging happens in a variety of ways. It tends not to happen necessarily by the Gleason score. It happens more by initially clinical staging is based on what we feel on exam. Um, how much of your prostate we think is involved, or do we find it because of an elevated PSA, or do we find it by some other mechanism? After we remove a prostate, you have a different staging. That's called pathological staging. That looks at what we find under the microscope, the extent of the disease. Does it go beyond the capsule or the outside edge of the prostate? Does it invade into any adjacent structures? Um, so those are where we get our main stages, and we look at where, whether or not it's spread outside to lymph nodes and bones as well. And, and how do you get this Gleason score? From a biopsy. From a biopsy. Okay. So uh, our caller is gone, but okay. uh, perhaps he's not had the, the uh, biopsy. We go to uh, Dennis, who is calling us from Sheffield. Go ahead, please, Dennis. Uh, yes, I had uh, uh, a prostatectomy. Uh, my samples of my biopsy, all 12 samples came back positive. And I talked to my urologist and, you know, the different course of action. I proceeded with the robotic surgery, and I have done, I've done extremely well. I was up and around the following day, and I was home. 
Wow. Uh, Good for you. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, faster healing time and and less problems. And now my uh, my Gleason score is zero. Wow. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your phone call. You do uh, robotically assisted uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. Why would a patient use robotically assisted versus standard surgery? Well, to be perfectly honest, the cancer outcomes have not been very different. They've been very similar. People who do open prostatectomies still have very good outcomes from a cancer control standpoint, and we're almost equivalent in terms of control of continence or leakage of urine afterwards. The main thing that I think is an advantage for doing a robotic surgery is that we lose less blood during surgery, and there's probably a little bit less pain and a little bit faster healing afterwards. Uh, we can do it with really good visualization as well, so we kind of have a better idea of what we're actually cutting through and seeing rather than doing an open surgery, which you do predominantly by feel. You know, choosing a surgeon mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. really important, and I'd like to know when, when a, a man goes into a doctor's office, is there some magic number? Does he want to know, you know, my surgeon has performed 20 of these a year <laughs> or 10 a year to feel comfortable? I have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> um, the, the, the answer to that is, particularly with robotic surgery, it's a really hard question to answer because the robot has not been around for more than about 10 years. And 10 years ago, it was in very few locations, and it was, it was monitored by research people and academics who were starting to learn it. So my generation, people who have been in practice only for a few years, we're the first group that actually learned it going through our training. Everyone else learned it after the fact, and that's a big difference, I think. Now, that said, the surgeons that have learned it that have been out were really proficient open surgeons and were very good at it. So it's hard to know what the right number is. Is it a smaller incision using the robotically assisted? Much okay. It much is. It's a series okay. of smaller incisions rather than one larger incision. Okay. So, so it's, you're it's inserting a camera. Laparoscopic? It is laparoscopic yeah. surgery. Okay. It's, okay. These are basic. The robot actually, it's kind of a misnomer because everyone thinks, oh, there's a robot doing my surgery. The robot is just an instrument holder. So we still do a laparoscopic surgery, but the robot smooths my tremor if I had too much coffee. It magnifies things, and, it, and it's a graded movement so that if I move several centimeters, it moves one so that I have a little bit of uh, mm. control of my ability to move. Those are the benefits. Are there any uh, disadvantages to robotically assisted surgery? To the health system, yes. We hear all of this stuff about Obamacare and all of these other things that are out there, the Affordable Care Act, and it's a more expensive surgery. Uh, by, so by what percentage? I don't know the exact number, but it's several thousand dollars. Um, okay. So that's one of the one of the downsides to it. Um, the other is that there is a mechanical element to it, so there's always the risk that it could break and there could be other problems with it. Um, but otherwise, it's essentially the same surgery. So let me ask, and then I want to do a quick reset, but, but how do you determine which patient you'll do the robotically assisted surgery on and which one will get the open surgery? Almost everyone gets a robotic surgery. Uh, and I would tell you that nationwide, that's actually been the trend, that the vast majority of surgeries in the last five to 10 years have switched from being open to being robotic. And greater than 90% now, I believe, nationwide are done robotically. The ones that we choose not to do robotically are typically people who have had extensive abdominal surgeries before, where we think that there's a lot of risk to going into the belly with laparoscopic instruments. And it's a little bit safer to do it open, where you can control things and repair any injuries that you would see. OK, interesting. I want to come back and talk about radiation in a moment. Yeah. But if you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live Prostate Cancer on WPSU. Our guests tonight are Dr. Richard Ditlow, Jr., an oncologist with the Prostate Cancer Center in Camp Hill, Dr. Christopher Yingling, a urologist with Mount Nittany Physician Group and State College, and Greg Peterson, WPSU's Director of Broadcasting, who was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2002. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. Of course, if you would prefer to email us, our address is connect at WPSU.org. You can also join us on Twitter by tweeting at WPSU. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, Dr. Ditlow, about the different forms of, uh, of radiation. Uh, Greg Peterson had the brachiotherapy. Uh, you uh, use the external beam radiation. Why and what's the difference between them? Well, <coughs> it's actually Excuse a me. third. Excuse me. Uh, as you've already heard, the, the uh, implants or brachiotherapy, which is, uh, is seeds injected, it's for mostly, it gives you a very high dose within the prostate gland itself. Uh, you don't get quite so much around because you have to have uh, solid tissue to hold the seeds in their proper geometrical pattern to get the dose that you want. And the tissue around the outside is not, strong, not good enough to handle, to hold the geometry. So you use this for generally lower, uh, low risk cancers where you're not worried about uh, it going through the capsule, that type of thing. And so that's what that's for. Uh, external beam is used more for the intermediate and higher grades where you are concerned that there may be some extension through the capsule that we don't know about and or in high grade, uh, high risk disease that the lymph nodes may be involved. 
There's also a, a new type of external beam radiation called CyberKnife, uh, which um, Sounds is, high tech, it, it, it is very high. It's a special machine that does all sorts. Of, but it, it delivers the radiation in about two weeks, five, five or six treatments as opposed to nine weeks. Problem is, and it gives a much closer uh, coverage of the, the prostate with it. So the worry is that it's not covering enough for higher risk disease. So it's really useful for, again, low risk disease. And the advantage is that the patients don't have to go through nine weeks of treatment, which is you know, the advantage of that. But there's really questions of whether or not it it's covers enough area for uh, the higher Gleason scores. And that well, when we're thing. talking about uh, radiation, how likely is someone who's received any one of those three or four different kinds of radiation to then suffer from impotence or incontinence? And what determines mm -hmm. whether they'll have those complications or not? Well, Part of what determines that is other medical problems. I mean, if they're, if they're diabetic, because well, what causes long-term damage or complications from radiation is scar tissue that internally forms that blocks off the very fine blood vessels that go to all these organs. I'm sure everybody gets the scar tissue, but in some people, more forms than others. Uh, and so if you, you cut back the blood supply, then that's when you get the, so people who are already diabetic or have other problems have already have a circulation. poor blood supply to begin with. And so that increases the risks of that. Uh, of that. That's primarily an age because as you get older, uh, the blood supplies aren't as good either. Okay. I'm going to go to a phone call. George is on the line from State College. Go ahead, please, George. Uh, yes. I had a tuna uh, procedure close to 10 years ago, I think, and it was helpful. It allowed me, it reduced the size of the prostate and I could urinate more comfortably. However, in the course of time, uh, well, it, ha it had a secondary effect that it um, made uh, orgasm more difficult to achieve. It was still possible, but difficult. Now, if I had tuna again, which it seems I need, I have a lot of discomfort with the prostate now, would this make orgasm impossible, or would it further impede it, or would it not have effect uh, this time? Thank Could you, you? Thank you. Um, what, what was he? If he had what? A, a tuna procedure. A tu okay. So a tuna procedure is actually a, a procedure for benign prostatic enlargement. It's for urinary troubles where men have a difficult time urinating. BPH. BPH. Uh, so different than prostate cancer. Unfortunately, one of the most common side effects we have from any of those treatments for benign prostatic hypertrophy is actually that people have what we call retrograde ejaculation or they don't have a typical orgasm. Uh, and that's a sign that we're actually treating things successfully because we're altering the structure on the inside. Unfortunately, the side effect is that you don't get much that comes out uh, when you have an orgasm and it bothers some men. I would tell you that if you had another tuna, there's a good chance that that would get worse or disappear altogether, but I can't tell you that specifically because uh, every man's a little bit different and some men do preserve it afterwards. But if you had trouble the first time, I'd say there's a good chance you'd have trouble again. All right, thank you for your call. We go now to Frank who's calling us from Hillside. You're on the air. You with us, Frank? Uh, well, yes, sir. I yeah. had uh, seed implants about 13 years ago. Go ahead. We can hear you, Frank. You had the seed implants 13 years ago? And I have the uh, PSA done at least twice a year, but recently the PSA jumps from like 0.2, then it'll be 0.6 next time, then it'll be back to 0.2 again. What causes this? <laughs> it can be a number of things. Uh, most likely, my guess is that there's a little bit of residual prostate tissue that's still viable and alive that's there. Um, but it can, small variations, it, under half a point, um, probably alters some dehydration and other things throughout the regular course of life. But um, a small amount of viable prostate tissue can produce a little bit of extra PSA and get you in that range from 0.2 to 0.5, and it may come back and forth. And you're just telling him not to worry? As long as it keeps coming back down, you tend not to worry yeah. too much. Okay. <laughs> I do remember after my uh, uh, surgery, went it went up, mm -hmm. and then it went down. Is that just common? Uh, I had brachytherapy, and my PSA went up. Uh, higher than yep. it used Prostate was, balance. and then finally just went down yep. to zero. It, it can. The, the theory is that the cancer cells are dying, and they're just releasing all their PSA at the time, and so you will have no. an increase. Uh, in the PSA. And, and we're and talking, when we say PSA, we're talking about a prostate specific antigen, uh, antigen mm -hmm. a protein. Right. right. Okay, which is this protein is an indication of a tumor. Just no, well, no, more. Or can't, a, a higher, a high number. Because be normal a, prostate okay. cells make PSA too. Okay. I'm going to go to this email and then to our phone call. Uh, this email comes from David. He writes uh, What are the doctor's opinion on taking finasteride? 
to, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, to mm -hmm. control prostate size and make the PSA test reliable. Finasteride is kind of an interesting medication from our standpoint. There was a trial done several years ago to actually look at finasteride as a preventative mechanism for prostate cancer. Um, overall, I believe it reduced the number of prostate cancers we saw, but unfortunately we found higher grade prostate cancers, so we don't use it as a protective measure. As terms of shrinking the prostate, it certainly works. We use it from a standpoint of urination problems, that it can help reduce your risk of needing a tuna or a terp, those other procedures we talked about briefly before. Um, it also tends to cut your prostate-specific antigen, the PSA, in half after you've been on it for six months or so. Um, does it make it more reliable? I don't know. It can vary a little bit with that. Uh, it does tend to kind of normalize it a little bit in the sense that it doesn't fluctuate as much. Um, so in certain cases, I do use it for that purpose, but I think you have to know where you're starting and you have to know the trend and, and what the pattern is to know if it's really helpful. Uh, Greg Peterson, I, I wanted to ask you, what's the monitoring now that you're nine, ten years uh, out with undetectable prostate cancer? The PSA once a year is the standard thing I do. Uh, go and get, give some blood, and it's pretty simple to do. And um, and uh, I'm just you know hopeful that, that it's not going to rise up or any. If it's undetectable, that's pretty good. Uh, and then now it, there are some urological implications that I have to take care of. I may have to, I may need another, I can see Dr. Miller on Monday and I may, he may say, oh, you need another turp or something, but we'll find, I'll find out. But, you know, at least it's, it's important because, you know, he explained to me that, you know, your, your creatine level can go up and it can be bad not to, not to empty and not to, not urinating at all is really bad. And, um, but uh, if you don't, re if you retain too much urine, that's bad too, because that can cause infections and things like that. So luckily I've, I haven't had those yet, but you know, this is 13 years after surgery that I'm still having some urologic problems. I want to talk about overtreatment when we come back, but first this, uh, this uh, email message that we got from Pat who writes, does being an avid bicyclist affect the <laughs> prostate? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would say, I would say it can, and the, re the way it affects the prostate is not that it increases your risk of prostate cancer or, in or increases your risk of benign uh, prostatic growth, but it, it can affect your PSA. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of things that we know will transiently increase the PSA. Anything that puts pressure directly on the prostate, which is actually located right basically where a bicycle seat hits you, can cause Although the PSA Although there are bicycle go. seats ma made specifically <laughs> for men. That's true. That's true. I've seen That's those. That's true. <laughs> but we see the same thing with motorcycles. We see it with people who operate heavy machinery. Um, even when you have your PSA checked, recent sexual activity, things like that can slightly affect your PSA value. Okay. I, I wanted to ask, I, I read that uh, an aspirin a day may have an impact on, on reducing your risk of prostate cancer. Is there any truth to that, or is, that, is the verdict still out? Again, it's in that it, range. There's some studies, yes, some studies, no. I mean, I've it, seen that, too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, there are other yeah. things that have mentioned that Lipitor or excessive coffee drinkers actually have a lower risk of prostate cancer. All these things, I don't think any of us really know what to make of those yet. Saw palmetto, I'm guessing that the herbal remedy is right. in that same yeah. same class. Okay, uh, this question, we have another uh, email question. This one comes from Dave who writes, if a digital exam only examines one side of the prostate, how often are the signs of cancer on the prostate missed because the signs, bumps, etc., are on the part of the prostate that the doctor can't feel? Interesting question. Prostates, amazingly, are not uniform internally. They actually have different parts of the prostate that have different functions and in turn have different risks for having prostate cancer. The back side of the prostate we call the peripheral zone of the prostate and about 70 or 75 percent of prostate cancers arise there. So we can cover the majority of the posterior, the back side of the prostate, um, with a finger exam. So we feel a lot of them. That said, a lot of prostate cancers you can't feel. They're internal and they're not in a location where you would be able to feel it. So we do certainly miss some. Certain men, just their body shape and habitus just keeps us from being able to feel much of the prostate. So we miss them, but it's better than not checking. But And, and you're feeling for hardness or softness and, or any irregularities? What I tell people all the time is that your prostate should feel like the soft part of the thumb. And if you feel something that feels like a knuckle, that's the kind of thing that raises a red flag to us and makes mm -hmm. us say we need to look closer and get a biopsy. And right. the PSA should pick up mm -hmm. these the ones they can't find. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because okay. you really go by that to begin you with. Know, I'm going to take Bill's phone call in a minute, but you said what took you to the doctor in the first place was uh, prostatitis, mm -hmm. which is what takes, uh, which is the reason that most men end up going to see a urologist mm -hmm. in the first place. Um, how common is prostatitis, and is it an indication that you were uh, might have prostate cancer, or is there really no link between the two? 
It's very common. We see a lot of men who have it. We see Even it from, young men. Absolutely. We see university students regularly who have prostatitis. And some men, prostatitis is just a stress response. As other men, it's infectious. It happens for a variety of reasons, and it shows up in a variety of ways. It's really not very fun to have, but we don't think it increases your risk of prostate okay. cancer. Good to know. Uh, Bill from State College, thanks for your patience. You're on the air. Yeah, hi, doctors. Um, okay, yes. I have a question. Um, I've been using finasteride. Uh, prescribed by, by a urologist for the last couple of years based upon a study uh, out of uh, one of the New York hospitals that it would uh, allow the prostate to uh, suppress the growth to make it more readily available. Uh, if, if you had to have a needle biopsy, it would concentrate the, the cancer cell. Is that, is that still a legitimate use of uh, finasteride? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's similar. Someone asked a question that was somewhat similar before, but uh, we know that finasteride use, long-term finasteride use, tends to shrink your prostate so that you, architecturally the prostate's actually different. It's smaller. Uh, it can reduce by 30 or sometimes up to 50 percent, depending on how long you've been on it and your reaction to it. Um, we also know that on the, the original studies that were looking at this for a way to concentrate it and try to help, hopefully help prevent prostate cancer, we found that they the problem with it was that we found a higher percentage of high-risk prostate cancers. We don't know for sure why that happened. We're not sure if it's because the prostate shrunk and it helped us find those cancers a little bit earlier, so we were seeing a shift because of that, or if it was actually causing a higher rate of those cancers to arise. We don't think that's the case, but uh, it probably doesn't make a drastic difference in terms of your prostate cancer risk. There's also another drug that's pretty widely um, prescribed, Flomax. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's the mechanism for that? What does it do? So Flomax operates by a slightly different mechanism. Flomax, your prostate is essentially like a donut, and you pee through the donut hole. Uh, and that's right outside of your bladder, and there are muscles that line the, the, basically the, the opening of the donut, mm -hmm. the donut hole, as well as the bottom part of the bladder. Flomax works on those muscles to expand it and give you a slightly larger space to be able to urinate through, um, which in turn keeps people from waking up as much at night, gets, gets you having a stronger stream, and being less And what are the bothered. side effects of that medication? Um, There's probably a long list of them. There are a couple of things. People get rhinitis. It means they have a, almost like a head cold. They'll have a little bit of runny nose and congestion. Occasionally people get a bit lightheaded from it. And there's one sexual side effect from it, and uh, we spoke about it a little bit earlier with a different patient, but we get something called retrograde ejaculation, which is it relaxes those muscles so much that when you have an orgasm, you don't have much fluid that comes out. But I will say it's probably the one drug I've ever heard that does what it says. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. It's well named. <laughs> All right, we go to uh, John, who has a, an email question. He writes, are there any new procedures or exercises one could do to eliminate leakage after a prostatectomy? Oh. And I'm probably messing up the pronunciation there. Yeah. Are there exercises? Oh, I've read yeah. Kegel exercises, <laughs> yeah. which is well, what they recommend to women. Kegel exercises make a lot of sense. It's the leakage after a prostatectomy is what Explain we call it. Explain what Kegel exercises Kegel are. Kegel exercise is basically know. tightening the muscles that control your ability to hold your urine. So it's the pelvic floor muscles, the ones that are deep on the inside uh, that are very difficult to describe how to clench, but it's the kind of thing you would use to cut off your stream or stop your stream when you were trying to urinate. Um, Kegel exercises strengthen those muscles because that muscle is the only thing left that can hold your urine in place after a prostatectomy. Prior to a prostatectomy, your prostate actually helps hold the urine in the bladder. So once we get down to one thing, we need to strengthen that. Kegel exercises for some men are all you need. Typically that's guys who have very little leakage. People who have severe leakage after a prostatectomy, if they're more than six months or a year out, they're probably going to have that permanently. And then in that case, we have two procedures that we use, actually three procedures that can be done. One is something called a, a urethral balking agent. We don't do it very often, but you can actually inject some material around that little muscle outside and try to tighten it up a little bit. The other things that we use are something called an artificial sphincter. It's actually a balloon that goes around the urethra um, and actually has a mechanical device that we implant in the scrotum. Everything's internal. You actually activate the device when you want to urinate, and it relaxes the balloon and lets you pee, and then it refills the balloon. It's a hydraulic system. It has water on the inside or saline on the inside, uh, and it keeps you from leaking. And the third option is something called a sling, and that's a small piece of mesh. We use them in women as well, but they're a different variety, and we create a little kink in the urethra, the tube that drains the bladder, to try to tighten it up and keep you from dripping and leaking. You mentioned the, the, the sling, mm -hmm. and I think anyone who watches any amount of television yeah. has heard that there have been lawsuits related to yeah. the sling. <laughs> Yeah, fortunately they're really <laughs> safe, and even in women, those those slings actually really weren't part of the lawsuits. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of other mesh used in the past for other reconstructions, and women particularly for vaginal reconstructions, for prolapse, and uh, those are the ones that were called back in the lawsuits and things. The sling material we use tends to be really well tolerated. It's much more similar to the mesh we use for hernia repairs. 
things of that nature, and people do really well with them. Okay, all right. Uh, another uh, email question. This one comes from John, who writes, what is the PCA three test used for? And, and it, does he mean PCA and not PSA? No, this is, a, this PCA, is a, okay. an additional test. Um, because PSA is so nonspecific for prostate cancer, we have a lot of men who have kind of a borderline rise in their PSA, or they have a family history or other risk factors that make us concerned that you might have prostate cancer. PCA3 is something we use, it's actually a urine test that we use um, to try to help differentiate who has a PSA rise or, or who has real risk factors for prostate cancer. So I, I would call it an adjunct test, it's just an add-on test to the PSA to help try to figure out do we really need to do a biopsy, how worried do we need to do to be about you. Um, so we use it a lot in men who have risk factors or men who have had a prior biopsy, but we're trying to avoid the need to re-biopsy them four months later because their PSA went up a little bit higher. Um, you know, speaking of, uh, of other tests, you know, the PSA, as we've been saying, it, it can't distinguish between aggressive and benign cancer. Um, but there is a test out of Sweden that will be available beginning in March 2016, and it's referred to as the STHLM3. Uh, I know you know a little bit about it. Tell us, tell us about this, and are you excited yeah. about it? Well, I only know about it because you put in the information. <laughs> I got to look it up. But apparently it, it's a, uh, a test which picks up it was only positive if the uh, car cancer is at least in seven or greater. In other, and therefore, if it's, you know, and so therefore, and those are the people that are uh, more prone to biopsy and because they probably have more aggressive disease. And that's my understanding. It's sort of experimental in Sweden right now. And uh, like you said, it's coming on the market. But that's, that's all I know about it. it. It also, though, it presumes that you don't have to treat Gleason grade six disease, which if you're going to, anybody for active surveillance, if you, you're know, going to definitely do that, certainly the Gleason you know, grade six disease are the ones you would at least consider it. But I mean, I've seen you know, patients with you know, metastatic disease with a Gleason six too. I mean, so, but anyway, it sort of assumes that you, know, you don't care if they have Gleason grade six disease. So, you know, you just mentioned the word active surveillance or mm -hmm. watchful waiting. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, you know, you, uh, you're, you're sit back and don't do anything mm -hmm. too rashly and most people say if we're talking prostate cancer there is some time you, you usually mm -hmm. don't have to do things uh, rapidly but what's interesting is that the, you know what how do we prevent over treatment because I would guess you would say Greg Peterson that in a sense maybe you were over treated I, I well you know my, my own choice too you hear the word cancer and and um, and you just want to get rid of it but then you know all the stuff that's come out and how much treatment there has been and how low my numbers were and all that I probably could have waited several years, mm -hmm. many years maybe, before I did anything. Uh, and, um, and that's what, you know, but, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. But, you know, I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I don't have to worry about it now because probably about now I'd be doing something about it. Mm -hmm. So, but how do we, how do we avoid over-treatment? So, actually, there's been an amazing trend nationally to go to more active surveillance, more waiting and, and keeping an eye on this rather than rushing in to do surgery. When I started my training, if someone suggested that, they kind of were looked at cross-eyed and everyone thought it was a nutty thing to do because there was cancer and you mm -hmm. needed to treat the cancer. Now, I think the latest numbers are, I think 40% of men with low-risk prostate cancer are choosing active surveillance in the U.S. Uh, that's a great thing. So we pick the men based on their Gleason score, based on their risk factors, based on their PSA, and we have different ways that we can kind of categorize you into low risk, medium risk, or high risk, or even ultra low risk. Mm -hmm. And then we decide on what to do with you. Um, and more often than not, now with low risk, we watch. Um, it's the second leading cause of death mm -hmm. uh, among mm -hmm. American men, though. Uh, do you anticipate any changes in that as we watch? I w I don't think from watching because the reality of it is exactly as you were kind of saying that if you elect to go on active surveillance, it's uh, active surveillance, and we use two different names. We use active surveillance and watchful waiting. Active surveillance is what we push the most, and that does not mean we just say you have prostate cancer, we'll wait till something happens. It means that we're very proactive with how we monitor you. We continue to do PSAs every six months. We repeat biopsies typically one year out from your original diagnosis and then again after soon we're going to start probably adding MRIs of the prostate to try to identify if there's more aggressive disease and that's something that's kind of on the cusp now nationwide. Um, so we really keep a close eye on it and we know a sizable portion of men eventually will need treatment for their prostate cancer because of have progression. But the advantage of that is the men who don't ever progress can avoid the treatment. So hopefully we'll still head people off. And the complications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll head people off who really need it and avoid overtreating the ones okay. who don't. Uh, we have a, another email. This one is from Herbert. 
uh, who writes, I want a PSA test, but my doctor is discouraging me from getting one. He keeps saying it isn't necessary, but I'm almost 50, and I think I should have at least a baseline. What do you think? And if I pay for it out of pocket, what will it cost me? A good question. I've heard lots of people ask that. Well, Do Dr. The Dittlow. first thing is, if and even the um, if you have any family uh, history, any uh, it would be your father, or brother, or son who has had prostate cancer, you should have a PSA. And I think even the even the people who say who are against doing screening PSAs would agree with that. And that's sort of left out of the whole discussion. What they what they are talking about is screening programs. Uh, that's what they're really talking about not doing when it comes down to, but if you have routine risk factors, for asymptomatic routine for asymptomatic. But if, you're, if you have a family history, first of all, that's, uh, you should have a PSA. Uh, knowing what, what we've talked about here tonight, I mean, the PSA by itself doesn't happen. You, you, know, you have, then should have, if the PSA uh, is positive or high and you have a biopsy, then you'll know exactly what kind of cancer you're dealing with. And then you can have an, an intelligent discussion with a urologist or, you know, or a physician about what you should do about it. I mean, and that's, you know, that's, I think, the, way, the right way to go. You've had a number of biopsies, and I'm just wondering how, how risky are the biopsies? Did they cause any of the side effects we've talked about earlier? Um, no. Um, you have to, uh, I was given prophylactic uh, antibiotics after each uh, uh, biopsy because it's a, it, it, they go through your, your, your rectum and they use a, a needle to go through your bowel to pierce your bowel to go into the uh, wow. uh, prostate in a bunch of different places to get samples. So it, it, there is some risk in the procedure, but it's, it's pretty low, I'd imagine. I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head <laughs> no. here. It's a, the number we quote people is 1%. So one out of 100 yeah. people could potentially end up with an infection, potentially sepsis, meaning a fever, and sick, sick enough that you'd have to go to the hospital. Right. There could be some bleeding with it as well. It's not the most comfortable thing, but men actually pretty uniformly it, afterwards say it wasn't as bad as they yeah, expected. Yeah, okay, actually the preparation about, was worse than yeah. the, than the, the I, I think, biopsy. Yeah. I think the other worry with biopsy is that it's if the prostate cancer is encapsulated that you have just now uh, dumped the, the apple cart and now the mm -hmm. cancer could spread. Fortunately, prostate cancer is a very slow growing prostate cancer. It's not aggressive and we don't see that happen. Other cancers in other places can do that with needle biopsies. Prostate cancer just doesn't. Biopsies tend not to seed cancer in other locations. It doesn't increase your spread of metastatic disease. It's a pretty safe procedure. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have just a couple of minutes remaining, but I'm hoping to get Don from Bellwood on the air. What's your question, please, Don? Don, are you with us? If we don't yes, get... Thank you. Oh, go for ahead. Me. Yeah. I, yes, I had external beam radiation. I had external beam radiation treatments in 2012, and my problem is that in 2013, my PSA went from 0.8 up to 4.5. In six more months, it went up to 4.9. In six more months, it went up to 5.3. So we see a, a worrisome velocity, as they call it, and I'm under a lot of stress. My doctor's are watching and testing, of course, every six months. But I, I just find it hard day to day almost to bear up under this because the doctors I have here say there's nothing I can really do as far as uh, further treatments that you've mentioned, you gentlemen tonight, like prostatectomy or more external beam radiation. I can understand why not the latter. But I, I just wonder if you have some thoughts on what I should do yeah, we just have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to let them get to it right off the bat. Uh, Dr. It's Yingling? Hormonal. Yeah, we certainly have other treatments we can do. There are hormonal treatments, things like that. We generally shy away from surgery after radiation because internally it does change the structures and it makes surgery a little less safe and more complicated. Um, but there certainly are other treatments. The other thing, and I, I'm not sure if you can speak to it, I know occasionally we see something called PSA bounce after radiation. Uh, and In other it words, it goes up yeah. because, mm -hmm. of, because Again, of the, the same radiation. Thing. But I believe, he said, how, how long ago was your surgery? Or radiation? How long? I, I don't know. 2012. 2012 I think. Yeah, that's a pretty long time. Right. Yeah, we'll so it see. shouldn't. He shouldn't have the bounce. No, we usually point. see that right towards the end of. If we see it, we see it towards the end of the radiation, which is why quite often the urologist uh, will wait about two, three months after the radiation is over to uh, do a first PSA. But that's unlikely. That's radiation bounce. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes uh, remaining, and I'm sorry I can't take another phone call. Uh, I, I just want to start with sort of a round robin, beginning with you, Greg Peterson. There are lots of young, uh, lots of men out there. Um, 
who are concerned about this issue, what advice would you have for um, them? Don't be squeamish about getting a DRE. I know a lot of people who, uh, I have cousins who just wouldn't do it because it was an anathema to it. It, it, it. it may be embarrassing, but it can save your life. Talk to your physicians, do your homework, um, and it's you have to take care of yourself, and you have to listen to yourself. But don't don't be squeamish about something like that. And I know some. That's some the way men pe people felt felt about colonoscopies, and, yes, and exactly. then Katie Couric did it on air, and I think the uh, the rate of colonoscopy right. uh, so, colonoscopies yeah, went up off doctors. the route. Um, Dr. Ditlow. I, no, I just say if you're over 50, especially if you have uh, you know family history, you talk to your doctor into doing the PSAs, knowing what you know now. I mean, you may not need treatment and don't necessarily feel that if you uh, have a prostate carcinoma and it's at least in grade six that you have to do something you know, treatment-wise uh, with it, but still get the PSAs. You can't have that discussion unless you know you have the cancer. Dr. Yingling. I, I agree. I want to echo everything that they just said. I think the number one thing is don't be scared of finding out what's going on. So don't be afraid to get a PSA. Don't be afraid of a finger exam. It takes two, two seconds. We don't enjoy it either, but it helps a lot. And if you have prostate cancer, it does not mean that you have to have treatment. It does not mean you're going to be incontinent or impotent or have all of these side effects down the road. It may mean we just need to manage it, but it can also save your life. Uh, and, and what are survival rates for uh, for prostate cancer? Uh, the low risk prostate cancer, it's outstanding, close to 95% for 10 year survival. High risk prostate cancers are lower than that, um, but a lot of that also depends on age and other right. comorbidities. Okay, thank you all so much. Uh, I'd guess. like to thank our guest tonight, Dr. Richard Ditlow Jr., an oncologist with the Prostate Cancer Center, Dr. Christopher Yingling, a urologist with Mount Nittany Physician Group, and Greg Peterson, WPSU's Director of Broadcasting. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, thanks for joining us and good night.